We are looking at Mark chapter 9, verse 1 to 13. He said unto them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what, he, what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, Why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it was written about him. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Today we are on the uh, series, on the 12th in the series of the Apostle Peter, and we are talking about Peter as a man, Peter the person, the apostle, and some of his experiences. And uh, Peter tells us that this, there was one time in his life when he saw God's kingdom power and majesty. I wonder if there's an indelible event in your life, that there is an event in your life so moving, so life-transforming that you can never forget. And it happens to many of us. For some of us, it is an accident that we averted. You know, we should have died in the accident and we didn't die. For some people, it's an illness. They should have died and they didn't die. For some, it's some tragic event that you know, somebody suffered some terrible loss. And no matter what it is, many times all of our lives will never be the same again when that event happens to us. And it is a common thing in all our lives. Something happens so much so that at almost any point in your life, you look back to that event and say that event must have some meaning. But in the greatest likelihood, we do not exactly know what that meaning is. But it has an effect. We just don't know what it is yet. Sometimes we wish we know. Sometimes um, if you survive a terrible accident, you wish you know what this accident means and why God... Uh, brings you through that accident, but sometimes you don't have an answer and you wish you, you have one. You don't. Uh, sometimes it is the loss of a loved one and we wish we have an answer. You know, sometimes um, uh, someone in our group once had a family had an accident and, and the husband and the child died, you know, um, and then you wonder why something like that happens. And many times we look for these answers, but we know that our lives will never be the same again, but we don't know why. We don't know why. So here, what we have is an event in the life of the Apostle Peter. The transfiguration or this, this thing that happened to Jesus was something so remarkable that he would never forget. This and the resurrection of Jesus Christ were the two most stupendous events in his life. And at that time when it happened, he really didn't understand why it happened. Something else had to happen again later before he could tie everything together. But at that point, he really didn't understand what he was seeing. Now, the, the um, transfiguration is a very remarkable thing because this is the only miracle that happened to Jesus. Jesus performed many miracles. He healed people. He you know, uh, walked on water. He fed 5,000 with uh, um, five loaves and two fish and all that. But this is the only time that something happened to Jesus himself. 
Okay, so in that sense, it is absolutely unique. This is also the turning point in the life of Jesus. In the early part of his ministry, he was healing people, he was healing the sick, he was teaching and all that. But after this event, he turned his face towards Jerusalem, meaning that he knew he was going to Jerusalem to die. And he was deliberately taking a path that was going to lead to death. And he started telling his disciples that I'm going to die. I'm going to die for your sins. I'm going to die and then be raised up from the dead. And so this was an important turning point in the life of Jesus. Now, I know we are not so familiar with the term transfiguration. Well, the word transfiguration came from the Greek word metamorphosis, from which we get the word metamorphosis. Um, what does that mean? Well, as you know, the caterpillar metamorphosizes into a, a pupa and then into a, a moth or a butterfly, right? Essentially, the creature hasn't changed. It is the same creature, but it has changed in uh, its form so that it does not look like the same way that it looked previously. And that is the same thing with the transfiguration. The transfiguration means that he was um, uh, transcended into a different realm. And it is not a an event that happens to all of us, and that is why we have this strange word describing it. Okay. Now, we need to compare Mark chapter 9, the passage that we read, with 2 Peter chapter 1, when Peter describes the event himself. Mark, the Mark's gospel describes what he heard from Peter. Um, Mark wrote down what Peter thought. Then in 2 Peter, Peter himself wrote down what uh, he saw. Okay. So there's a crucial qualifier. In order for us to understand this event, we must understand a few things. And the first is found in Mark chapter one, uh, chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. He said to them, that is Jesus, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Uh, so some who are standing here, meaning that there are some who are going to see the kingdom of God come in power and some will not see the kingdom of God come in power. Some will see it before they die, some will not see it before they die, right? That's what the word some means, okay? Six days after that, Jesus took Peter, James and John and they went up to this high mountain and that was when this event happened. So Peter, James and John were the only three people who saw this event. None of the other disciples saw Okay, so uh, it was a very exclusive event. Sometimes in our world today, we want big events and we despise small beginnings. Well, here it was a very small beginning, but it was an absolutely life-transforming event for Peter, James and John. They saw something that nobody else has ever seen uh, before them or uh, from that time on, the transfiguration of Jesus. Now, I would like to make a side note saying that it was after seven days. You see, sometimes people ask, why is it that the Bible contradicts itself? Well, it doesn't. But sometimes it does appear that way because in Luke's gospel, it says uh, on the, um, after eight days, or, or sorry, um, uh, eight days later, this thing happened. Okay. Um, in Mark's gospel and Matthew's gospel, it says after six days. Well, there's no contradiction because after six days, meaning that the first day is not counted. Okay. So then they count six days and then on the seventh day, something happens. Okay. So if you were to count normal days, it will be seven days. If you say after a certain day, then it's after six days. Um, Luke was counting inclusive. He was counting the first day and the last day. Okay, so, and that is why uh, he ended up with eight days. And um, Mark and Matthew says uh, after six days. Uh, uh, Luke says eight days and they said six days. Okay. Now, when and how was this fulfilled? That is, how did they see the kingdom of God come in power? Well, this was fulfilled at the transfiguration. But what does it mean? I mean, we don't see any great display of power. And yet Jesus says that you are going to see the kingdom of God come in power. And then six days later, this thing happened. So meaning that this was the fulfillment that Jesus had promised them. The meaning of the event is this, that the kingdom of God has come in power, meaning that it has already come. It is not future to us. Many times people talk about the kingdom of God as something in the future or something that is within their hearts or something that is in heaven. But Jesus says, no. When you see this thing, it is evidence that the kingdom of God has already come. 
It is not something to the future, but it is a demonstration that the kingdom of God has already been realized. Of course, there is a future reference, but at this particular point, uh, he was not talking about the future, but the immediate, that it has been fulfilled already. Now, what is meant by this? Well, we go back to Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 2 in the Old Testament, that means during the time of King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, the Babylonian king had a, a, a dream. And he had this dream, and then he wanted somebody to interpret this dream for him. But he was very suspicious of all these dream interpreters, that maybe they cook up some interpretation. How do I know whether this interpretation is real or not real? So Nebuchadnezzar is not a dumb king by any stretch of the imagination. He conquered the whole known world at that time. And so he told his magicians and his astrologers and his soothsayers and the dream tellers and fortune tellers saying this, in order for me to be sure that your interpretation is correct, I want you to tell me my dream and then tell me the interpretation. But then those folks were saying, this is totally unreasonable. Nobody has ever asked us to tell, how can I tell you your dream? Uh, well, Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, nothing doing. I'm not going to tell you. You have to tell me my dream. Then I know that your interpretation is real. So nobody could, and he was about to slaughter the whole bunch of them. And Daniel was a very junior guy among them. And, um, and Daniel says, you know, allow me to ask God, and, um, and, and he would uh, reveal to me. So he prayed, and God revealed to him the dream that the king had. So he said, King, this was the vision that you saw. You saw this statue with a head of gold and, and then with the torso of silver uh, and, and with uh, uh, legs of um, uh, bronze and then, uh, or rather, the, the lower portion, the, the abdomen and all that of bronze and then the legs of iron and feet of iron and clay. And then there was this great stone that came and smashed this image and this, um, and smashed it to smithereens and, um, and the wind blew and the kingdoms or, or the, the statue couldn't be seen anymore. Then this stone grew up to be a great mountain and filled the earth. So Nebuchadnezzar, the king, says, yeah, you got it right, you know. So now tell me the interpretation. So he told him the interpretation. He said that, well, gold represents you. You are the great king, the great kingdom. Uh, you have absolute say, and you are the head of gold. And the shoulders or the upper body of uh, silver would represent a kingdom that would come later. And eventually, uh, that kingdom turned out to be the Persian kingdom. And then after that would be the kingdom of bronze, and that was the Greek kingdom. And then after that, iron, which was the Roman kingdom, uh, Rome, the empire of Rome. And then it says, after that, there will come this stone that will just smash everything away and it will grow up. It will grow up and it will um, cover everything on the face of the earth. And this is what Daniel said. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not with human hands. So here we have a throwback to the earlier prophecy of Daniel. Now, Peter's own description is this. He says, We did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when a voice came to Him from the majestic glory saying, This is my Son whom I love, with Him I am well pleased. You'll recall that that was exactly what happened during the transfiguration. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on that sacred mountain. Okay, so, uh, this, so this was something that was indelible in Peter's mind. But at that time when it first happened, he didn't fully comprehend the meaning of it. Well, first let's run through the event itself so that we don't um, leave out any major issues that we, uh, that we should cover. Well, we are told that after six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John. Now, those six days of, uh, were crucial days because what happened was this. Before this event, uh, there, 
Peter and Jesus had a little bit of a confrontation, which we talked about last week. Um, Peter's expectation of Jesus is that he's going to be the king. You know, so if you become the king, I become the prime minister, that looks like a good deal. You know, uh, so he wanted Jesus very much to be the, the physical king of Israel. But Jesus says, no, I'm going to the cross to die and then rise from the dead. And Peter was very upset and rebuked Peter uh, and Jesus. Peter pulled Jesus aside and says, you must never do this. And then Jesus turned to him and said, Satan, get behind me. So he called Peter Satan. <laughs> you know, I'm sure Peter uh, didn't like that very much. Uh, so there was a bit of tension between Jesus and, and uh, uh, Peter. And so you can understand that for these six days, probably there was tension in the air, you know, um, and nothing was, much was happening. And we are not told exactly what was happening during these six days. Probably they didn't talk to each other very much, you know. Um, but then after six days, on the seventh day, Jesus took Peter, James and John and brought them to a high mountain. And this high mountain, we're not exactly sure where it is. Some, well, traditionally, it is considered Mount Tabor. Mount Tabor is a unique mountain. It is a typical mountain that children draw when they are drawing mountains. They draw a nice cone-shaped mountain, you know. And Mount Tabor is a unique mountain in the sense that it looks the same. Doesn't matter which direction you look around it. Okay, so it has the same shape, almost a, a perfect cone. Uh, but it didn't appear to be so because Mount Tabor is not very high. Okay, uh, more likely Mount uh, uh, Hermon, uh, which is a much higher mountain. But we do not know exactly where that mountain uh, was. Uh, where they were all alone, meaning they were all by themselves, just uh, the three disciples and Jesus. And then he was transfigured uh, before them, meaning that he changed in his form. And his clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could uh, bleach them. And then there appeared to them uh, Elijah and Moses. Now, uh, it's very difficult for you to catch it, of course, but later on, we always have Moses and Elijah. Having Elijah and Moses is a bit odd. Why? Because Moses lived before Elijah, okay? And Moses was a more prominent person than Elijah. But here, it was Elijah and Moses. And the reason is this. After that, there was a conversation about Elijah. And that was why Elijah's name was put first over here. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Now you notice this. The word rabbi is significant because rabbi is simply a Jewish term uh, addressing someone as a teacher. That's all. You know, or um, calling someone a pastor or calling someone a, a, a professor. Um, and no more than that. So he only addressed Jesus as a rabbi even though he was seeing all these wonderful things. And, and he says it, it is good for us to be here. Is somewhat banal, but then we are told that, you know, he didn't really know what else to say, you know, and he had to say something. So he said, well, I guess it's good for us to be here. And let's build three shelters, you know. Um, according to Jewish tradition, during the Feast of Tabernacles, they will build little shelters and booths. But I guess what Peter was saying is this, that, you know, this thing is, that's happening is so remarkable and we don't have anything with us. We, we came here barehanded, but at the very least, we're going to put up some shelter so that we can sort of stay here permanently to see this, this uh, situation here. Uh, then a cloud appeared and covered them and a voice came from uh, the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Okay. So Jesus is uh, God's son. He's the one I love. Listen to him. So uh, in other words, telling Peter, Peter, shut up. <laughs> don't, don't be talking so much. Just listen. All right. And suddenly they looked around and, um, and they didn't saw, see anyone with them except Jesus. And then they were coming down the mountain and they had this conversation uh, and Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen till, they had, till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And then they kept asking themselves what rising from the dead meant. I mean, they were thinking it couldn't be literal. If he rises from the dead, then he must first die. And how can a dead person ever rise up from the dead? So they were just talking about it. 